Hi, my name is Kelvin. I have grown up in a coffee farm that has been in existence since 1954, 67 years back. Did you know coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil? And one thing, once coffee is processed to parchment level, it cannot be transported without a movement permit. That is before 6 a.m. and after 6 p.m. And this is my story. My journey actually began, like I, I say, way back before I was even born, because uh, this farm was uh, first established in the year 1954. That's around 67 years back by my late grandparents, Mr. Sivin Geshangi Mithamo and his wife Jane Wamboy. Uh, they planted their first uh, coffee bushes of around 3,000 bushes on a, an 11 acre piece of land. When they passed on in the year 1995, my parents took over the farm management and my uncles too and the crop production was too high and uh, we could not continue selling the coffee into the cooperatives anymore because uh, it, it was quite tiresome, the labor was very high so we decided to come up with our own pulping station where we would uh, acquire licenses and start pulping. We call it basically the primary coffee process where you pick the coffee you pulp it, it's sorted, it's fermented, and we get to see that process. Um, we do all that until it's, it reaches a parchment level, where now you uh, forward it back to the uh, millers, who now mill it and grade it to at least a, a, a quality or a grade that can, can be roasted. The impact that I have had from uh, this farm is that I was, I was I've gotten to see the whole process happening uh, when my grandfather passed it over to his sons and then we are now coming in as a new generation to at least continue with the process of what is happening. And um, I remember after high school I wanted to be a chef so I wanted to join a hospitality institution. And coincidentally, I was to join a restaurant where I would work as a waitstaff for a few months, then uh, join uh, probably Utali College and uh, train or take a course on the normal hospitality courses that are known. Uh, apparently, there was a lady supervisor who introduced me to barista. I was to join them as a waitstaff, but she told me that the position that I was to take uh, had already been filled. So she told me I would become a barista. And I was like, who, are, who is a barista? She explained it very well. Uh, she told me that I would basically be serving uh, hot beverages, that is tea, coffee, chocolates, and uh, dispatching any other orders like pastries and stuff like that. So I agreed wholeheartedly because I knew I have a coffee background, but I didn't know what uh, it entails. So I worked with them for some time. After a year, I joined another bigger institution who had very sophisticated machines and uh, that's where I got to see about uh, latte art, cappuccinos, espressos and uh, other very different uh, beverages made from coffee and they were very uh, specific about the quality. If you, if you did the bad quality they would just discard that and you had to make a new cup of coffee. So through and through I then joined one of the biggest uh, coffee brands in, in, in Kenya and East Africa. Um, I, they trained me more on, on coffee. They, they would take us to their factory, train us on how they do their roast profiles, uh, and we would at least engage 
a lot and get that emotional feel with coffee. And being uh, from a coffee growing family, I was very interested in knowing what happens after the coffee is brought from the farm to the cup. Uh, funny enough, when I was a kid, I knew that all the coffee that we farm and we take it to the factory is all exported and then brought back to us. So I didn't get to engage coffee much. And we also knew that those people who drink coffee in their homes were only the rich people. Uh, so I didn't get to interact with coffee when I was young, but at least growing up and joining the barista career, I was able to interact with coffee much. And then um, with time, I stayed in that company for six years. I had managed to join their sales team, who were very supportive, and I learned a lot. So I decided to come back home continue with the generational uh, thing and we have a brand that we named in the honor of our great-grandfather. His name is Stephen Kishangi. Um, and so we branded the coffee Stephen's Coffee. Having been exposed to this kind of uh, very giant coffee shops and getting to explore more about coffee and what happens, uh, I realized that there is so much information lacking back in the village where people don't know what they do with their coffee next after the primary processes from parchment level. So there have been so many middlemen who come to the farms, they make the farmers sign contracts and they get their coffee and they uh, take advantage of that. So basically I knew that if I came back to the farm and we started doing variation to our coffee, we would at least get a better cup and even uh, better quality and better pay. At the end of the day, that's what a farmer wants. Quality, quantity, and better pay. What was happening is that um, my dad and my uncles were doing, uh, were already, they, were, they were already doing variation by roasting small quantities and packing them in smaller packs for the local consumption and in the, for sale in kiosks and small retail shops. So when I came back with the exposure I had uh, had from the major companies I had worked with, I decided to introduce them into bulk packing of uh, one kilo packs, 500 grams, 250, and even a newer thing that they didn't know that you can pack your coffee as beans and sell it to coffee shops that don't have the equipment. And uh, it has been good because uh, we're already supplying uh, several coffee shops in some of these major cities, like so of Kerugoya Town, Bungoma, Nanyuki, Nairobi, we're also supplying some. So that was a game changer when I introduced the coffee beans and they didn't know how that would happen. So I just brought in a sample in a small pack and I told them this is what I want us to do. I have, I've made a price list, we have a good uh, package for them because we offer free basic barista trainings to coffee shops that we supply. We do free deliveries uh, within a radius um, and we also do uh, uh, flexible payment terms, yeah. So basically that was it and they were very supportive. They were willing to let me do it and uh, since then I've been working uh, as a general sales manager and looking for new markets. Having come uh, to an already established uh, farm, uh, I learned a lot because um, coffee has seasons. In most cases coffee has two seasons and within those seasons in a year uh, there are various activities that you're supposed to uh, be hands-on, uh, e.g. pruning, um, uh, weeding, applying pesticides, because what we are growing in this farm is an SL28 and 34, which are very susceptible to pests and diseases and climatic changes. So you have to take very good care of them. So for anyone who is interested in joining the coffee industry, one, you must um, know what variety does well in your region, the temperatures in your region, the altitudes, and coffee needs a lot of water. That's why we say that coffee that is grown on a, a higher altitude, it's very good even in the cup. You get a very clean cup, uh, high in acidity, that is citric acidity, uh, very fruity and very floral. So you get very good uh, attributes from that cup. Uh, that is something I had only learned theoretically, but when I came back to the farm, I got to realize that these are factors that affect farmers a lot. If farmers are not knowledgeable about what they're supposed to do in terms of coffee agronomy, then uh, you'll be in a mess. For instance, if you have like one acre piece of land 
there are some inputs that you're supposed to consider. There's labor, uh, there's uh, the seedlings, and the fertilizers or manure that you need to put in to the coffee before you, you grow it. So it also depends on the kind of variety you want to grow. In our case, we have the SL grafted. It takes around two years to mature and you start harvesting your first crop. And in a well-managed coffee bush, you can get up to 10 kilos on average. That's on the lower side. You can get 10 kilos of uh, the coffee cherries. And uh, going by, by the mats, like probably what people were paid uh, with in the previous uh, season, it goes like 100 shillings. So an acre piece of land can fit up to 500 coffee seedlings. So by going by your mats, 100 shillings per, per kilo on a bush, and one, one bush gives you around 10 kilos. So that's probably 1,000 shillings per bush. With 500 of them, that you're counting about 500,000 shillings. But of course, with the uh, inputs that you put in, the labor to pick the coffee, the transport, and stuff like that, you, your margins will probably be at 60%. And going back from my grandfather's experience, this coffee farm is as old as 67 years old, so you can imagine, and we're still harvesting. It's not that bad, we're still harvesting. So I, I think coffee is the way to go, and, these, and you can harvest coffee for as long as almost 100 years. Beyond very addition, our farm is able to produce surplus of around four tons uh, of, uh, I mean, green coffee when it's already milled. And uh, in the years uh, back, we've been able to sell our coffee through the auction and also through direct sales because we are licensed to do direct sales of our coffee to oversee buyers. Um, and our coffee, we had joined as a group of eight farmers who were called the Slopes of Eight. And if you Google that, you see that very many specialty coffee shops in the likes of UK and other Europe countries have done a story about how the Slopes of Eight farmers came together and pioneered a group that produces coffee, mainly from estate farmers like us. And uh, they enjoy their cups in most of the specialty coffee shops around there and they appreciate what we have. For those wondering how the coffee auction happens, when we harvest our coffee, we take it through a pulping station where it's pulped and there's a whole wide uh, process that happens there until you reach a parchment level. From parchment level, the coffee is taken to a coffee mill. They do the milling, the polishing and grading of coffee to the eight major uh, grades that are known in Kenya, which are based on density and size of the screen. So I can name a few which are the AA, AB, C, Peabody, uh, E's and TT and TT, uh, T and TT's. Those are some of the major grades in Kenya. What happens is the, coffee, the Nairobi Coffee Exchange have uh, a sample room where coffee dealers get their samples, they do the cupping, and based on the kind of coffee they feel that is good, and some of the notes that we check in coffee are the acidity, the body, and the aromas. Those are the major things that we check in coffee. So a dealer picks the coffee from the coffee sample room, they do the cupping, and they identify where the coffee is from. And if they like it, then every Tuesday of the week, Nairobi Coffee Exchange holds an auction where people go and bid for the coffees based on what they felt like. And that's where they bid probably, and, and coffee is basically sold in dollars in Kenya. So the higher the quality of your bin, the higher the price you're able to get or fetch from the auction. So not just going by the rosy side of the coffee uh, business, there are some of the challenges that we face as farmers, and that is what basically led us to value addition. Some of the challenges start from the farm. With the wrong uh, crop variety, you mess it all. Your coffee will be uh, affected by diseases, uh, pests, and the climatic changes. Coffee is very susceptible to some of these uh, uh, climatic changes, especially on the Mount Kenya region. We realized we, with having all these challenges, we also encountered, uh, encountered other challenges uh, on the parchment levels, because uh, middlemen come in, uh, they leap off you, your, your crop, and you're forced to sign some contract with them, and you don't get what, you don't get value for your money. So it ends up going to the wrong hands. So what we decided is uh, 
start doing variation and enjoying the coffee from tree to cup. At least we engaged with the market directly without having to go different ways. We at least focusing to move forward and be direct in the market. Another concern um, in the coffee uh, sector is the upsurge of real estate in some of the coffee estates and other coffee growing regions, which is becoming a concern because in few years to come, we might end up not having this crop at all. So losing the Kenyan coffee would be a very uh, bad thing because actually Kenyan coffee is referred to as the Conicea's Cup. Similar to the wine, we know some of the best producing countries for wine. Kenya is known to produce some of the best coffees in the world. That countries abroad uh, buy our coffee to blend with theirs to at least increase the value of their coffee. So with the upside of estates uh, and real estates, uh, this is a very worrying trend. And it's because people haven't uh, had to enjoy what coffee can give in terms of revenue uh, and, and stuff like that. But in your sense, if you add value to your coffee by roasting it yourself, have it uh, displayed in the supermarkets, distribute it to restaurants, have people enjoy coffee at home because what basically people know about coffee is just the black coffee or white coffee. They don't know that you can enjoy a coffee with a twist. Add chocolate to your coffee becomes a mocha. That is what you enjoy in some of these big uh, restaurants and you pay so much money just because of the little twist and you think that coffee is important. So people learning to appreciate uh, the coffee drinking culture in our country that will help the farmer back in the village to at least get the motivation to uh, continue growing their coffee and stop this real estate thing. At least let's appreciate what we have uh, by ourselves. Now that I've shown you what happens in our farm, walk with me as I show you what happens in the factory as we prepare the coffee for the market. Uh, after picking the coffee in this red uh, form, uh, coffee is weighed to at least account for what happens uh, or what uh, quantities have been harvested. Then uh, it is sorted. Uh, you see, human is too early. Sometimes uh, they pick green coffee, uh, some leaves will fall into the bucket, sticks and maybe any foreign material. So we pick the coffee to at least have that consistency in quality. Uh, we come and sort it from here. Uh, from after sorting, we take it to the cherry hopper, uh, which holds the coffee before pulping starts. The coffee is pulped into uh, fermentation tanks, where the coffee is fermented for around uh, 24 to 36 hours. But also, it also depends with the kind of weather that is there. If it's very hot, the coffee ferments very fast. If it's cold, uh, then the process is very slow. After fermentation, the coffee is then uh, put into washing channels where it is cleaned and pre-graded based on the density of the bin. So the most dense bin is called the parchment one. That is what, what we call P1. There is parchment two, which is less dense. There is parchment three, and there are the lights. So that is basically what happens on the washing channel. From there, the coffee is taken to the soaking tanks where it is uh, soaked for six hours, then we change the water and soak it again for six more hours, and then uh, take it directly on the raised beds. The raised beds are usually one meter high to at least avoid any splash uh, by rainwater or obtaining any foreign uh, smells from the ground. Then uh, the coffee is dried for, uh, until it attains a moisture content of about eight to 10 or even up to, the most it should be, should be at around uh, 12. Once our coffee is uh, dried to the right moisture content, it is, uh, we take it to a, a mill. Uh, some of these facilities are very expensive to acquire, so 
uh, we outsource from those who already have the mills. We do the milling, uh, and then uh, we also outsource the roasting machinery, because at least it's also economically viable. Uh, having, uh, I mean, using one uh, machine from whoever has it, instead of having to buy your own when uh, you're still young and growing. So that is a point where you start, you outsource, and when you have the quantities, now you, have, you, can, you can now buy your own. So we outsource the milling facility, we have our coffee mill, then we take it to a roaster who roasts our coffee to whatever roast profile we want. Uh, we are usually present there, so anytime they are roasting our coffee, we are usually there to at least make sure the, con the, the quali quality is consistent. They also do the packaging for us, so we only provide the packaging materials and whatever we want put on our coffee and uh, then the coffee is ready for the market. What we are currently providing in the market is uh, this one kilo pack, which is available in beans and grounded form, medium and dark roast. And in most cases, we supply this to hotels and restaurants since it's a very commercial one. Then the smaller pack, which is a 500 grams, and the 250 grams, we provide it for the local consumption or domestic consumption for home use. But also anyone who is interested can get this uh, kind of a pack and uh, it can get delivered to you. That is my story.